Right now, we're bringing on the program a gentleman who, uh, as I say, he is uh, he happens to be, I guess, the office mate of him at, uh, at the MLB Network. Longtime Sports Illustrated senior writer Tom Verducci, one of the most noted baseball writers in the country. Happy to have him on to talk hot stove. Tom, good to have you in tonight. Welcome to the FDH Lounge, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you, uh, Tom. Uh, I, I'd like to get your, your insights. I'd like to start here. Uh, on the subject with uh, Derek Jeter and everything going on uh, there, and and everything as far as both sides of the coin, it's all been kind of splashed out there, and and, and people are are taking their sides on the issue. Uh, The thing that I wonder about is, does Derek Jeter, and I'm editorializing here and using the word delusional, but is he delusional enough to think he's still that guy to get paid at the level, not just the the amount, but the length of the contract, uh, essentially that he's the guy that he used to be? Or is he seeing how much this is worth to the Yankees in terms of the mystique, keeping him a lifetime Yankee and deciding that he wants a piece of the pie as far as that goes here? Is, is it delusion? And again, I'm editorializing on that, but is it delusion? Or is it the sense that the Yankees are going to make money off me being a lifetime guy and I'd like my share of it? Well, I think part of it is the difficulty of trying to put a value, a numerical value on what that mystique and value to the franchise is. I mean, if you have a, a five-year player or a six-year player with uh, certain stats that you can compare to other guys, it's a little more obvious. But when you're a franchise icon the way the Jeter is for the, you know, the richest organization in baseball, and then you're going to get differences of opinion on what that value is. And I think people also have to remember it's part and parcel of negotiations. I mean, no one's going to go in there and, you know, if you're a player, ask for the, what you would settle at right away. And the club certainly isn't going to give its best offer first. And I think this is, as surprising to me, it's played out very publicly. So every twist and turn as these things happen, you know, happens to them in New York, they get amplified. So it's funny that first it came out that Jeter was looking for $150 million. Then another story came out that said, no, he actually didn't. It was lower than that. And then a third story came out and said he never actually made a formal proposal at all. And I think with every twist and turn, people are overreacting to things that may or may not be true. So uh, I just look at it as let's wait to see when the dust settles and, and not really start formulating opinions about people or policy uh as they're going through the process yeah it's it's really quite a a tangled uh, type of of tale but there are a few things about this that actually do seem kind of crystal clear uh one would be that uh you know for all of the talk and i've heard a little bit of it uh, that uh he's tight with don mattingly so perhaps the dodgers uh might be in the mix but i gotta think even minus frank mccourt's divorce related finances that the dodgers would not be looking to pay him on the same level here essentially he's not worth to any other team what he's worth to the yankees uh it, it, it's not a very convincing i'll see you in hell card on his part is it because he's going to take a monster pay cut to go somewhere else uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's really not about going out and trying to find a better deal if Derek Jeter leaves the Yankees. You know, I still think he's going to, going to get it done. The Yankees and Jeter are going to work it out. The only reason to even look elsewhere is if you feel like the clues you're getting from the Yankees means, I'm not sure these guys really want me back. You know, they took the negotiations extremely public for a guy who likes to do things private. You know, they've been pretty firm that we're going to cut your pay, and we're not going to pay you more than three years. And there hasn't been any movement off of that. And, you know, for whatever reason, Jeter feels like, hey, I just don't like where this marriage is headed. I need to go find a better place to finish my career. That's not about the dollars. It's just reading the tea leaves here and the campaign the Yankees have run to say, you know, maybe this team is better off without me. Maybe that's the way they feel. I don't think that's going to get to that point. But I agree that it's not a case of Derek Jeter or, or anybody who's been with a team this long saying, I'm going to go see if I'm going to get more money somewhere else. That, that, that's not the issue at all. 
Exactly, yeah. He, he doesn't have a prayer coming close to uh, even the Yankees' lowest offer elsewhere with anyone else. You had a very interesting column recently as well about uh, some of the, uh, the biggest 2010 free agents uh, not coming as, as advertised, and, and I really kind of found myself nodding my head in agreement with a lot of it, uh, whether it be uh, a guy like Cliff Lee, who at this point in his career, he's going to be getting paid big money into what are some of the danger years, of course, for a pitcher or Somebody like uh, Jason Wirth or Carl Crawford, who quite frankly, uh, over the course of their contracts, are going to be asked to be perhaps more than they really are. It was very interesting once you kind of started poking around there at some of these guys. Uh, the common denominator seems to be a lot of guys in the right place at the right time with a fairly thin uh, free agent market in terms of top guys. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right about that because at this time of year, obviously we don't have games to talk about. I think it's the most dangerous time of year for clubs because we do talk about free agency and, you know, overanalyze things a lot. And sometimes guys start looking better in December than they did in July and August. It's funny, the other day at the MLB Network, we were taping a segment, and one of the intros to the segment was about 12 months ago. The big guys who were signed, we rolled video of their press conferences, and it, it turned out to be Jason Bay, Matt Holliday, and John Lackey, who all got a ton of money. And they all talked about, hey, this is bottom line was I want to be in a place where I can compete and win. And guess what? They were all home when the playoffs came around. You know, there's three of the biggest free agents that were out there last year. And obviously, you know, one team doesn't sink or swim with one player. But those big expenditures did not turn into a postseason berth for either the Mets, the Red Sox, uh, or the Cardinals. So, you know, I think you do have to be careful because guys tend to look a lot better based on who else might be available at this time of year. But you have to factor in a lot of issues, and I, and I think especially with a guy like Cliff Lee, who I think is obviously he's easily the best pitcher out there. But once you start talking about paying a guy at 38 and 39 years old at $23 million, now, the track record will tell you that's not a very smart thing to do. And I would expect that to, to blow away the Texas Rangers, the Yankees are going to have to go into that kind of territory where they begin to overpay and, and add on years, like adding on another pancake on top of a pile to make sure they get a guy that they desperately need. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's a situation where the Yankees are built to be able to withstand something like that in, in a way that other teams uh, aren't. And uh, when, when you look at a team... Like the Giants that won the World Series, uh, they, they've got uh, some great young players that they're going to face the challenge of locking up uh, in the years to come. Uh, in, in the very same division today, uh, very interestingly, uh, Troy Tulowitzki locked up now through uh, 2020, uh, seven years uh, and $132 million for this deal. Th this is something where... This looks to me like the epitome of, of money very well spent because I said toward the end of the year, I mean, it was just my opinion, but, boy, if you had a one-two punch in the lineup to build around, could you do any better than uh, Tulo and Carlos Gonzalez? And, you know, one down, one to go as far as locking them up. They're not going to have to worry about uh, Gonzo for a little bit yet here. But uh, are, are you as impressed with this move, Tom, as I am? Yeah, I mean, listen, he, he's the type of guy that I think you can feel comfortable giving long-term money to and understanding it's not going to change his approach. And I, I think with a guy like Tulo, I think the numbers are only going to get higher. I don't think there's a real benefit to waiting on a guy like this. If it's a pitcher, obviously, it's a different story because, you know, you're always, you know, one surgery away from being a completely different type of player. Positional player it's pretty rare if you find somebody who has any sort of injury that really has and forces their career to take a 180-degree turn. So I think you can feel comfortable given the way this guy plays the game, his approach, the way he takes care of himself, and the fact that he is going to run into some huge numbers in contracts if you went year to year with him, playing the shortstop position and putting up power numbers. I mean, that's, there's not too many comps out there to deal with. So I thought it was a smart thing to do. Uh, I know some people may say they jumped out a little too early on this. Why do it now? I think you do it now because it's only going to get more expensive with every year that you wait. Uh, that being said, they probably don't have much of a chance of doing something similar with Carlos Gonzalez. You know, he's a Scott Boris client. Those guys tend to want to go out and see what they can get on a free agent market to determine their value and not be proactive in signing long-term deals. And I think it might also be very difficult for the Rockies to have as we get farther down the line, two guys making, you know, upwards of, you know, say high 18s to $20 million 
uh, unless they find a way to add a lot more revenue to what's coming in there right now in Denver. So long term, it's great to know, if I think if you're a Rockies fan, that your shortstop's going to be there. You can grow up with this guy if you're a young kid, uh, and you can realize that, hey, I can fall in love with him because he's not going to turn around and leave next year like we see a lot of pl- big-time players do. He's there for the long haul. He's a Rocky pretty much for life. Yeah, an amazing deal, uh, kind of uh, Maurer-esque here when you look at the one that uh, Joe ended up signing in uh, Minnesota last year. A lot of similarities there. Now, I, I kind of prefaced that question a little bit here by talking about the, the team in their division that not only won the division but go on, and went on to win the World Series. I agree with the premise of uh, a recent column that you did in the aftermath of the World Series here, Tom, about uh, the Giants being built to uh, to keep contending because... Uh, as I see it, and I'd be interested in, in, in hearing your thoughts on this, again, you've got that core, you've got that front four in the, uh, in the rotation here. Brian Wilson, who's really matured uh, in, in the bullpen. Uh, Posey behind the plate, going to be one of the best hitters in the next decade if he stays healthy. You've got a half dozen guys right there where it's very enviable. Some dead money coming off the books in the next couple of years with Renneria and Rowand and eventually Zito. Hopefully you can lock these guys up here. Uh, is history not going to, I mean, it, I, I hate to, to rain on their parade, but is history going to regard them as being underachievers if, if this is it? Because i, I got to think you're, you're obligated to win at least one more in the next couple of years when you got that kind of nucleus. Yeah, they have a real nice young core. I'm not so sure how long they can hold it together. I think the real key is Tim Lincecum. You know, two more years before he's able to leave. And it's going to be very difficult, I think, to lock up Tim Lincecum to something long-term. I mean, he's just put up an incredible resume at this point with three strikeout titles, two Cy Youngs, you know, closing out the World Series. Uh, you know, there's very few guys in the game who've done what he has done at age 26 and 27 and, and going forward. And I know Tim has heard this his whole career, but at his size, how much longer would you extend him? So I, that being said, I do look at these next two years as a, a window where the Giants can really keep this thing rolling. You know, it's going to be very exciting to see what Buster Posey can do given, you know, 500, 550 play appearances in a full major league season next year. Uh, just so impressed with him and his approach at the plate, and really approach to the game. It's mature beyond his years, and I think we've got a franchise guy like Minnesota behind the plate with Joe Maurer. You've got that franchise guy back there uh, at a young age, hitting in, in the middle of the order, and in Buster's case, I think he's going to develop even more power. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good foundation to build around, and we all know about the pitching, and they have a farm system that is starting to turn out some better players now. It was a long dry spell with position players, but they have a few coming, so I think the Giants are really well positioned, and I think it's a very competitive National League West, but there's no question that they're the team to beat for the next couple of years. Not only that, I've been wondering about this as well, some potential parallels here, Tom. You look at the Philadelphia Phillies, who The size of the market itself, of course, has been constant over time, but we didn't really look at them as at least even a quasi-big market team until they started winning. All of a sudden, the fan support is even higher. They're putting the money back into the team. The Bay Area is just a ginormous media market, uh, all told here. And I know they're they're splitting it with Oakland as far as another team being there. But you factor San Jose and everything else into the mix here. They have a heck of a lot to work with there. Do you see San Francisco basically playing bigger as a market in the next couple of years and having more money to spend and putting back into the team? Uh, I do. I'm not so sure how high they can go, though. I mean, in Philadelphia's case, they were helped by moving into a new ballpark, um, and their television and radio rights really went way up. Um, and their attendance has just been terrific, basically selling out every game now. Uh, they had much more room to grow than I think the Giants have. And, you know, that being said, I think there's a lot of things the Giants can do to capitalize on the interest out there because I actually thought that there was a much more of a buzz about the Giants this year than there was in 2002 when they went to the World Series. Uh, the entire town just wrapped their arms around this team, and it was a very different feel than 0-2. Um, you know, I think partly because a lot of these guys were homegrown, at least in terms of the pitching, and I think the success wasn't really that expected for this team that you know really had to take the San Diego Padres down to the last day of the season just to get into the postseason. So, uh, yeah, I think the city has fallen in love with the Giants. I think there's an opportunity for the Giants to grow. I'm not sure how much more they can grow. 
Uh, but I do think it, it will be one of those franchises, sort of like where Philadelphia is right now, where when the season starts, you say, hey, the Giants are going to be in the mix. You look at them and say that they're the team to beat. Interesting. Well, those, those contrasts that you mentioned between the markets are, are certainly uh, very intriguing. I hadn't really thought about those uh, previously. Uh, that, well, that was very... me too of Minnesota. I mean, Minnesota went to a completely different level with their new ballpark. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with their payroll now going over $100 million. I mean, who would have thought we would have had the Twins with a higher payroll than the Los Angeles Dodgers? But that was the case. And, the, you know, the Twins now have really gone from a small market team to a one of the upper tier teams in terms of their revenues and their TV ratings are just completely through the roof in Minnesota. I know that the demographics in terms of numbers, they don't have as many as a Philadelphia or a Chicago or L.A., but uh, in terms of turning a, a town on to baseball and, and, and reaping the monetary benefits, I think the Twins have been one of the great success stories in baseball in the last 10 years. Well, with, with the Twins' uh, payroll uh, surpassing the Dodgers, which I didn't cr- quite realize until you said that, yeah, that, that puts it into very stark relief. And I'm thinking that Frank McCord is probably not one of those people who's a proponent of the expression, why is divorce so expensive because it's worth it. i got to think he's not saying that with the toll that it's taken on his uh, bottom line. But, uh, Tom, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't uh, bring this around and, and ask you here. Uh, I, I just mentioned in passing at the top of uh, the uh, conversation about uh, – uh, your uh, close proximity there at uh, MLB Network to uh, a new friend of our show, uh, Sean Casey, and uh, somebody who's been uh, very kind to us in the short time that we've been in touch with him. But uh, so, uh, what's it uh, what's it like to be in a close proximity to uh, the man uh, voted the uh, friendliest player in MLB, and uh, apparently an all around uh, great guy by what uh, everybody who's ever met him says? Yeah, I get to say I work out of the mayor's office, literally, <laughs> <laughs> because he is the mayor, and uh, and anybody who knows uh, Sean Casey, this comes as no surprise that that's who Sean Casey is. You know, there is not an ounce of phoniness or act in the man. I think he's just one of the most humble and nice guys that anybody, uh, you know, in baseball or out of baseball could ever come across, and that's that's just the way he is. Um, he doesn't act any differently around star players or. Writers or any doesn't matter who you are. He's the same Sean Casey, and I uh, I can see why a lot of people have called him. He played in a bunch of places, and a lot of people called him their favorite teammate. Yeah, I can I can truly understand that as well, especially after uh, being uh, privileged to uh, get to know him just a little bit, not as well as you do, but uh, you don't have to know him that well to know what a great guy he is. And I I have to say too, uh, Tom, that uh, when when I had found out a couple weeks ago that uh, you were potentially going to be in the queue here for uh, for getting booked for the program, I was very, very psyched for us to get the chance to talk uh, baseball with you tonight. And uh, it lived up to my expectations and then some. It was a true pleasure, Tom. We'd love to have you back any time. Thank you so much for coming on with us. You got it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Tom Verducci, everyone, from uh, Sports Illustrated and MLB Network.